Hey you guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Holly and thank you so, so much for watching. Today I wanted to cover the case of Dr. Margaret Tobin. I thought you guys might find this one interesting. I feel like this case, it could have been avoided so easily and I really just wanted to talk about it when I found it on the internet. So without further ado, let's get into it. So Margaret was born in the UK in 1952 to her parents Jean and Joseph Tobin. She moved with her parents and her one younger sister to Croydon, Melbourne in 1954. And Croydon is about 28 kilometers east of Melbourne's central business district. Her parents were known as 10 pound ponds, which is basically a colloquial term used to describe British citizens citizens that moved to Australia and New Zealand after World War II. The Australian and New Zealand governments basically set up these schemes where the cost of moving here was subsidized in the aim of creating basically a booming economy, more job prospects, etc. And it sounds really good in theory, but it didn't always go that way for the Poms that moved here, but that is like a whole a whole nother thing that I could talk about. Um, but if you guys want to do some more research into 10 pound poms, feel free to do that. There's heaps of information on the internet about it. But Margaret's family was a Catholic family and it was pretty common at that time for Catholic families to be quite big families. And there's a few reasons for that. One of those being that Catholic families didn't really believe in birth control. So they'd end up with a lot of kids. So Margaret ended up being the oldest of eight siblings. She had seven younger siblings. <laughs> I had to work that out for a second there. I was like, wait. I think one of Margaret's sisters, which was the one that was just below her, was also disabled, which I'm sure contributed to Margaret's really caring personality. I cannot imagine growing up with seven siblings though. I feel like that would be so crazy hectic at times. I grew up with three brothers and that was super, super busy at times, but seven siblings? Like, you know what? I'm so curious about whether you would be good friends with every single one of them is it like having seven best friends or do you find that when you get older you would drift apart if anyone watching has heaps of siblings please let me know I'm so curious but Margaret and her siblings were expected to just work hard and study hard like basically all other children around that time and Margaret really did she was a very conscientious child and she did really well in school. She really genuinely enjoyed studying and she graduated from Mount Lilydale Mercy College in 1970 at the age of 18. Through her whole life, Margaret was described as very headstrong. She was definitely a go-getter. If she wanted something, she was going to go and get that. And by 1978, when I was doing the research, there was actually conflicting sources, but in 1978, she either started or finished her study of medicine at the University of Melbourne but either way she went on to do a whole lot more study including training in psychiatry and also a master's in business administration. Some would probably say she was a very smart cookie. So in 1988, 36 year old Margaret took on a position with the Victorian Health Department policy unit and from there went on to specialize in the management of mental health services. Her job was pretty important because at the time it was coming out that there was a lot of abuse and misuse of power within psychiatric facilities. And and I really wanted to explain here a little bit more about what psychiatric facilities actually are. So let's go back to Sydney in 1838. This was the year that the first purpose-built psychiatric facility was actually created. It was in Sydney and was called the Tarbon Creek Asylum, now known as the Gladesville Hospital. Basically this place was made to house people that were seen as mentally ill. There was really not that much knowledge on mental health back then and people didn't know how to take care of these people who were schizophrenic, depressed, who were severely anxious, who had postnatal depression, etc. You know, the list of mental health issues a person can face goes on and on. But there was no real understanding of mental health and because of this, there was no real support. Psychologists and social workers and such were literally not a thing back then. The point of these places back then was to keep these people out of mainstream society. Once you were in, you weren't allowed out and a lot of the time, huge amounts of abuse would take place in these places. Fast forward to 1951, over a hundred years later, and there really hadn't been 
that much change within these psychiatric facilities. People in these wards were still not really ever allowed out, but thankfully social workers and psychologists had become a thing by this point, so they were utilized in these facilities. And slowly with the development of new medications, those were also used to help these people. One medication in particular was called chlorpromazine, which is an antipsychotic used commonly to help with treating schizophrenia. But the other side to this is that people could could be very easily over medicated. And they were. These places were almost always under-resourced and underfunded too. The good thing about these new drugs though, like chlorpromazine, is that they help manage and stabilize the symptoms of psychosis and mood disorders, which give people in asylums hope of being discharged. This was a really good thing too, because by the 80s, the general public started to care about the mistreatment that was going on in these places, which in turn put pressure on the Australian government to look into these facilities and see where the corruption was, which they did. And there were several inquiries into the Victorian mental health institutions. And this is where Margaret Tobin's job came into play. She was responsible for a lot of positive change that came from these inquiries and instigated reform in response to these findings in Wills Mayor, Melbourne, Lakeside Hospital, Aradale Hospital, Ballarat and Ararat Hospital. In 1993, she had moved to Sydney and was working in St George's Hospital in southern Sydney. Her job was a pretty tough one and a lot of the time she was dealing with staff who were potentially corrupt within their practices so I can imagine it was pretty intense at times and she definitely had people that did not like her because of this. People lost their jobs because of her and rightfully so. Within St George's Hospital Eric Gassy was a staff specialist who had at one time been acting director of the unit. The hospital hierarchy however had been unwilling to appoint him as director and there was a few reasons for this not only because apparently they felt like he was not up to the task which I don't really understand because they appointed him as like acting in director so he was doing all the roles but he wasn't officially the director so it's like how did you think he wasn't up to standard if he was doing that job but anyways, I digress. But he was also gaining a reputation for odd and sometimes paranoid behavior. Apart from being in conflict with some of the unit's senior nursing staff, get this, he was also known for propositioning young female staff that worked there. He was known to do that and he was still working there. It makes me so mad, so mad you guys that they knew he was doing this and he was still working there. But then comes in Margaret and you guys, when I was reading this bit, I was just like, oh, I have so much respect for this woman because she must have been honestly such a bad ass boss bitch. Cause she came in and she was like, no. This isn't happening. Margaret wrote to the New South Wales Medical Board requesting an evaluation of Gassy's fitness to return to practice after a period of extended sick leave, which is something I didn't have before, but he was on extended sick leave at the time. I'm not sure why. Maybe he'd been threatened by someone he tried to proposition, which is what I hope, but I feel like that is not why he was. But he definitely would have deserved that. But anyways, I digress. The evaluation ultimately led to his deregistration which became official in 1997. He had failed to comply with conditions placed on his registration. Two, I want to add, so he'd actually been given a chance to rectify his wrongdoings but chose not to. But either way, he was really mad about it and very, very bitter and he definitely blamed Margaret. Margaret was known for being a bit of a savage. Not saying what she did here was savage, but she definitely wasn't afraid to sack someone that wasn't up to standard, which meant that there were quite a few people that really didn't like her. I mean, she had a reputation for being tough and people feared her. She once described herself as not having a sentimental bone in her body, but personally, I think she was just someone who was passionate about advocating for those people that didn't have a voice to represent themselves and she wouldn't let anything get in her way and she continued to work. After working in Sydney she was appointed the head of mental health services for South Australia and she worked here for the next few years continuing to make positive changes in mental health services. Some of the services that Margaret had a hand in enhancing were mental health services for adolescents, stable supported accommodation for people with complex needs, 
Access to 24-hour emergency services for rural and remote regions. Greater integration of mental health services within a regional network. And provision of training and education. Support to attract and maintain an effective mental health workforce. So she did quite a lot. This was until 14th of October 2002. It was a rainy spring day and Margaret had just returned to her office in Adelaide. She had just gotten out of the lift on her level, which was level 8, when she was shot with four rounds of ammunition into her back at really close range. Sadly, because of how many rounds the killer used and how close he was to her when he shot her, she died pretty much immediately. Detectives arrived at the scene and locked down the whole building because at this point, no one knew where the killer was or what the real motive was. But they did know if the killer was willing to murder someone in a busy office building when she was literally walking with two of her colleagues in plain daylight, then they must be a pretty dangerous person. Neither of the two colleagues who were with Margaret at the time that this happened could remember the person that had shot her and this is pretty understandable because when you are faced with something that is really really traumatic which I'm sure this was you can forget really big details about the event it's just the way of your brain dealing with trauma and on top of this there was no CCTV inside of the building there was CCTV outside of the building but this didn't really help too much much and it meant that the police really had their work cut out for them. A breakthrough on the case came not too long after the incident though when another co-worker of Margaret's called Leanne Durrington remembered being in the lift with a shifty man that day. She had assumed he was just a courier because he had raindrops on his jacket and she even spoke to him about the weather. She said though that after their conversation she just got like this funny gut feeling that something wasn't quite right because she felt like he was following her but at the time she just pushed the thought away and continued with her day and all I can say you guys is trust your gut instinct sometimes you just know in your gut something isn't right and I feel like it's better safe than sorry and I'm not blaming her at all but I'm just saying in general an identikit photo was drawn up though from what Leanne remembered of this man and police used this for public appeals the man had a distinctive beard and long hair too too. Fast forward a little bit and a sound engineer by the name of Bob Champion saw the identikit on the news and the photo actually triggered a memory of his from six months prior to the incident with Margaret. Champion and can I just say his last name is so fitting isn't it? Had been smoking on the roof of the Brisbane Convention Centre one day when a strange clattering noise caught his attention. To him it sounded like the noise that would happen if you dropped a gun which he knew because he'd recently worked on a movie where actors were using real guns and they were like dropping them a lot and so he was just really familiar with that noise and so when he heard the noise he looked around to see where it was coming from and he made eye contact with a shifty looking man who was picking something off the ground and putting it back in his pants. So Champion said he notified the security of this because he was like wow that was like really dodgy and security actually took down the man's license plate number. And with this information, the police actually had a name for the suspect and that name was Eric Gassy. Honestly, these last names are like something out of a movie. Police found that Eric had been the one to hire that car six months prior in Brisbane and Eric actually had a gun license, but he had a clean criminal record. So police needed to find if there was a link between the two incidents. And this came when they uncovered that Dr. Tobin had actually been speaking as a guest speaker at that conference in Brisbane that day and she was known to Gassy. I'm sorry but like Gassy? How unfortunate. I feel like he was definitely bullied in school for that last name. But they had worked together at St George's Hospital in Sydney. Police uncovered that Margaret had actually been given a job that Gassy applied for and right after Margaret was given it Gassy went on his long-term sick leave. When he decided that he wanted to come back Margaret had been the one to ask for Gassy to complete a mental health assessment which as we all know didn't really go to plan. So with this information police had their motive. They just needed enough evidence to prove that 
Eric Gassi was guilty of this murder. So they decided to go give Gassi a visit at his self-contained little flat that he lived in on his parents' property in Sydney. When police got there, they said the flat was really, really messy and Gassi was actually acting really relaxed about the whole thing, which was suspicious within itself. I know that I definitely would not be acting chill if police came to my house and were like, oh, we just need to search your house. And I don't think you'd find many other people that would be like super chill either. Within the flat though, police found two pistols and ammunition. I'll add here though that the pistols had no fingerprints on them at all. It was like they'd been wiped clean. There was also a video camera that included footage of Gassy doing a lot of really close range sniper training. Police also took a calendar which had the Brisbane Conference Centre talk date circled on it. As well as a written list of psychiatrists with Margaret Tobin at the top and she actually had her photo removed so I'm guessing that there were other psychiatrists on there with their photos and Margaret you know was at the top and her photo was the one that was gone and although this was all pretty damning evidence police decided to keep looking because they felt like they really needed to get that piece of evidence that would prove that Gassy was in Adelaide at the time that the crime took place this last piece of evidence came when a man by the name of Brenton Poole came forward saying he remembered seeing a man of the police's description at a petrol station he owned just outside of Adelaide. He said he was on high alert as he dealt with quite a few shoplifters around that time and he just found Gassy kind of sus. He said that when Gassy paid for his petrol, he looked up and directly into the camera that was behind the man and I'll insert a photo of that here and the worker, Brenton, just thought that was really sus so he sort of kept an eye on him. He said then after Gassy paid he went out to his car and started emptying the contents of the car into a trash bag which he put into a bin nearby which again he thought was a bit weird but he was running a petrol station and a motel which was like connected to the petrol station and so he didn't have time to be watching this like one random guy like emptying the contents of his car. He thought it was weird but then he just kept on going with his day. With this information though the police decided Decided to dig up the local rubbish tip which they knew was where the rubbish from this petrol station would go and Brenton Poole himself was actually asked to help and he was actually the one that found this bag it was like a shopping bag that had the name of the petrol station on it so he knew that you know it would have petrol station rubbish inside and it did it actually had receipts in it which linked Gassy to the crime now police had enough evidence to start Eric Gassy's trial and they did Gassy actually wanted to represent himself acting as his own barrister which is really really uncommon it's believed he did this in the aim to show his competency but it kind of backfired on him you know, he was requiring people to address him as Dr. Gassy, which he wasn't, like he wasn't a doctor anymore, so that in itself was strange. And so at the end of this 11 week trial, which was October 2004, Eric Gassy was convicted of the murder of Margaret Tobin and was sentenced to life in prison with 30 years of non-parole. Eric actually appealed this and on the 14th of May 2008, both his conviction and sentence were quashed by the High Court of Australia following in an appeal during which Gassy had represented himself again. <laughs> the High Court noted that the trial judge's directions to a jury deadlocked after a day and a half of deliberations lacked neurality, causing a substantial miscarriage of justice. Gassy's retrial on the same charge took place in April of 2009 and he was convicted on the 6th of May 2009. So there's not too much known about Eric and of his life before this, but I did find that he originally came from the tiny little island of Marutus, which is near Madagascar. He came with his family when he was a child in the late 1960s, as his family was seeking refuge from the turmoil that was happening over there. The people there at the time wanted independence from the British ruling and there were a lot of riots and just general tension at the time so it's understandable that his family wanted to leave and come here for a more peaceful life. Moretus is independent now by the way and apparently it is like a beautiful place to go. So Eric was the oldest boy in the family or he was the oldest sibling in the family really and there was a lot of pressure on him to do well and his parents were just so proud of him when he decided to pursue a career in 
in medicine. And then again, when he became a medical specialist. I do wonder though, if because of the stigma of mental health back in the 90s and early 2000s, he never really felt like he could speak about his own mental issues. And I wonder if that's maybe the reason they were overlooked by other people around him too. I mean, I don't really know, but I thought maybe that played a part. Also, I remember when I used to study social work, they would say a lot of the time there will be people within the course that decide to do the course because they have their own mental health issues and they almost feel like by studying social work it will help them work out their own issues so maybe it was like that you know maybe that's why he decided to study medicine I mean it is also just a very respectful job so maybe that was his motive it's just a shame I guess that it all had to end how it did Margaret actually had an acute mental health building built and named after her called the Margaret Tobin Center. And there's a few awards now named after her too within the medical field. But it does seem like Margaret really lived her life committed to bettering mental health services and she really succeeded at that. I feel like there would have been so much more she would have done too if her life wasn't taken so soon. She has really inspired me to become more educated on mental health and research what I can do to help the people around me who suffer from mental health issues. I've included some links below to charities I trust, which if you guys want to donate to you are welcome to I know I'll be making some donations as well and with that this video has come to an end I never know how to end my videos I feel like I'm so awkward at the end so I'm really sorry about that but I really do hope that you guys learned something from this also you guys if you're wondering where my earrings are from they are from my friends little business the Aurora collective so I'll link her below too if you want to check her out and yeah with that I guess this is the end of the video so thank you so much for watching and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye you guys.